still starting and finishing place for a Grand Britain rally because it's sort of in the centre of Britain. I suppose that's why they choose Harrogate. It started for us many weeks ago at Boreham. The first thing we did was get the regulations and then make a decision whether or not uh, to enter. And of course, you, the, the really hard work starts. By the time, in fact, you've got to the start of the rally, most of the organisation, all the really hard work as far as Boreham and its staff are concerned, has already been completed. It's then up to the drivers and the mechanics who are going to service the cars on the rally. By the time you have the cars built and you've booked the hotels, and you've sorted out the insurance for drivers and co-drivers, and done all a million and one other things. Um, you know, that's all done well before the uh, rally even starts. And Ian Appleyard lowers the flag, sets the first car away, Harry Shellstrom and Gala Agbom going away leisurely in their Italian Lancia out of the hall with 2,500 miles ahead of them. And the next car is the Swedish Saab of the Swedish driver Stig Blomqvist, who is the reigning rally champion of Sweden. going to win. Britain's hopes lie mainly in the team of three works-prepared Ford Escorts. Their drivers are Roger Clark and Jim Porter of Britain, the Finnish driver Hannu Mikkola with the Swede Gunnar Falm as his navigator, and Timo Mackinnon also of Finland with Britain's Henry Lytton. Well, there are on this route 77 flat-out time sections, all on private ground. The main roads, which connect those sections, are really just ambling along to get from one vital time section to the next. And on these vital time sections, they total up to 375 miles. So of the 2,500 miles total route, only rarely 375 mean anything. And it's on those 375 miles that the rally will be won and lost. On those, it's a question of flat-out motoring, mostly on forest tracks, but this year on quite a few of them are on tarmac surfaces in stately homes of Britain.
RAC rally is the classic event amongst competitors. It's like the Monaco Grand Prix amongst Formula One people. It's the rally they want to do. I think the Monty stands equal with it, but that's a different sort of challenge. That's tarmac stages with special studded tires and so on. This one is a classic challenge of car and man. I think amongst the top dozen drivers, it doesn't really matter what car they're in because they're so skilled that they're capable of adjusting their technique to fit into the particular characteristics of the car. You need a strong Rally. I've never known conditions like it in, uh, in the North Yorkshire area up to Cholerford. Incredible. This is why Timo drove an absolutely um, fantastic rally up until now. Timo is something of a genius at designing tyres. Um, Dunlop were very pleased with the tyres that he designed and I saw Timo at the end of the fifth special stage right in the middle of one of the forests and um, I said to Timo, how are things going? And he very quietly put one thumb up and said, I on right tyres. And he was going absolutely incredibly fast. driving conditions as they spend their first night on the road. With the cars now heading for Scotland through Yorkshire and Northumberland, Timo Mackinnon leads the rally in a Ford Escort, with Carl Arrhenia second in a Saab. Finally, a man was convicted in court at Chatham today. Of What's the stages like, Rod? Well, you can't see most of them. Huh? All gone white. Doesn't look like stopping.
That's something to get the circulation going on a rather gloomy Sunday morning. One group of people who I imagine won't need any waking up this morning are the drivers on the RAC rally, who spent all night slithering around in the ice and snow on the Scottish border. Well, today they'll be driving through northern Scotland and we'll be bringing you Robin Richards with up-to-the-minute reports on the rally throughout the day on Radio 2. So keep tuned if you want to hear what's going on up on those cold, frozen moors. Actually, my girlfriend used to go out with a rally driver. She put it. How about last night? Oh, it was pretty tough. Yes? Yep. Worse than last year? Uh, yes, of course, with all the snow. I've never seen a RSC rally with so much snow. Well, we didn't get this far last year, did we? <laughs> snow all the way. In northern Scotland, um, they were having to cancel the stages. Um, one of the stages in particular, they sent the first 15 cars off and th they almost disappeared. And in fact, they had to stop the stage and sort of try and recover them back and get them back into the rally again. The main problem is just being able to keep the car moving through the deep snow on some of the stages. It's been one of the toughest nights in the history of the RAC. I would think the old days we used to get this blizzard condition which would throw things into chaos, but last night was the coldest, wettest, snowiest and iciest rally we've had for a long time. But it, it's, this is part of the RAC. Part of the sheer challenge of the elements, I think, just adds to the stature of the event. It's still one of the greatest rallies there is. But you can get this sort of thing in bad conditions, like Andrew Cowan being hit by a car coming the other way. He was stationary when it happened. Andrew Cowan was out of control. He did that. Coming up like a ding bat out of hell on the ice. Mad. No, hurrying, like everybody else. Well, really, that possibly you could say that was bad organisation, that there's such a situation can arise, but it's probably inevitable when you're trying to cram so many special stages into the rally. Find any roads in the forest. In which cars have now reached the Lake District? The overall leader is Timo Mackinen of Finland in a Ford Escort, who leads by two minutes from the Swede Jon Valdigard in his privately entered Ford. Third is Gunnar Blomqvist in an Opel, and fourth, Carl Arrhenius in a Saab. Another Saab driven by teammates Stig Blomqvist and Anna Hertz is lying fifth. And sixth is Frenchman Jean-Luc Terrier driving an Alpine Renault. The leading British drivers are Tony Fall and Mike Wood in their Japanese Datsun. Finally, there is still no news of the chimpanzee. give orders to Timo Mackinen. I honestly say it, it, it's an honor to sit by somebody like that because he could do my job, he has done my job, but what we couldn't... Ever
alongside a canal which runs through the middle of the Bradford City sewage works. And it's here in this 1900-acre grounds that a two and a half mile circuit for which the target time is two minutes, an average of way over 60 miles an hour is what they're striving to get on this tarmac roads. Tarmac, but it is snowing and there's quite a lot of slush. And as they come into my site, they're coming past the organic manure stores. They come into my site about 20 yards from me here and they come straight up towards this wooden swing bridge. The ramp leading onto that swing bridge is quite steep and so when they get to the crest of that they take to the air for about 20 feet and then slump down about in the middle of the swing bridge which is only eight feet wide. similar protections elsewhere uh, at the acid tanks for instance uh, perhaps I should think no one would want to go into that because he goes out of my sight towards the finish, twisting and turning and trying hard not to go into the fertiliser. Being the fastest foreign driver through the sewage works, Hanno Mikola won a bonus prize of two handmade suits. Now the drivers are in North Wales, where conditions are reported to be very muddy. Finally, the chimpanzee that escaped from Peterborough on Saturday. Gearbox. Oh, Roger and Jim came into the service point ahead of um, Timo and they'd seen Timo stop on the stage and it appeared to them at the time that uh, Timo was out of the rally. In fact, he wasn't. Um, we stayed at uh, the service point for about half an hour, three quarters of an hour later and Timo suddenly came screaming in. What had happened was the gear lever had jumped out of, um, out of the box and had stuck itself in neutral, which normally would stick in, normally if this happens it sticks in gear. And he's able to drive off the stage this time because he's stuck in neutral and took some time to get the gear lever sorted out. stage and we had a puncture on the rear wheel. We weren't particularly worried about this. We had done half the distance and we thought we could get to the end of the stage without any problems. And we're descending a long hill to a, a very slight T-junction at the bottom and uh, we were going quite slowly because, in our mind we were going quite slowly because we had the puncture. We knew we had and the car wouldn't stay on the road. We were having a fight to keep it on the road. And um, as we hit the T-junction there was a 
pile of wood shavings where the, um, so the foresters had been cutting up all the uh, small trees. And we hit this pile of shavings, being the first car through, and the car took off. And I immediately went for the handbrake as a sort of an emergency to sort of keep it on the road. But unfortunately, um, with the flat tyre, the car didn't respond in the, in the way I expected it. And, um, and we flew off the road. It, the car went very slowly off the road. We got to the edge of it, it stopped, and then it toppled over slowly. Okay, it was a sort of a gentle roll. We had a conversation as we went down. Mike said something about this looks rather serious. I said, I think it's the end. <laughs> As the RAC rally enters its final day, Stig Blomqvist of Sweden, driving a Saab, is three minutes ahead of his nearest rival, Bjorn Valdegard, in his Porsche. Today, the rally will complete special stages at Nebworth House, Woburn Abbey, and the pre-war racing circuit at Donington. <laughs> sort of a rally is a national event. It's better than the boat race, for instance. We haven't got a third gear, you see. We've only got a second in the top, and we're in top gear going very quickly around there. And, you know, we're just going to go in. We're going right into the middle. I thought I'm going to get a bit wet here. Uh, I mean, was the engine still running when you went in? Oh, yeah, but it soon stopped. This was where we were going to make a, the big decision whether or not um, to do anything to Mikola's car and we decided not to and carry on to the end. He was having a bit of gearbox electric trouble. We were thinking about a clutch change but in fact we managed to um, get into the finish without doing it. It would have taken too long. Yes, the, the mechanics not only have to be skilled mechanics of course, they have to be able to drive well, keep awake and of course you have to be able to navigate all the mechanic service schedules in fact give them six figure map references to work from so they have to be able to navigate as well we put some of our um, service crews in almost impossible places in the middle of forests the driver does the work on this event um, obviously up in the north of scotland it, it was it was difficult going up through uh, northumberland was difficult it was snowing and uh, fog and slush you know you had to keep going a bit the well, car's gone fabulously. All I'm a bit niggled is the sort of stupid, false reporting that's been going on by BBC included. Well, what do you mean by that? Today's papers said that we had smashed our gearbox to pieces, which is utter rot. You had some damage to the gearbox, then, didn't you? None whatsoever. This is what annoys us. So we stopped on a stage, yes, we had selector trouble. We just jammed the... Well, you can't... Uh, I can't explain it very well. We jammed the... Uh, 
uh, Gilly were really between second and third, and we couldn't get it out. That was all. I would like Timo to win, actually, because the way he drove over the last few days, he's deserved to win it. What do you think the greatest pressure is on, on a rally driver? Is it physical tiredness? Pressure. It's pressure all the time.